Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing assessing new databases, translatical use cases. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag ADB Analytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change this to network with everyone. To find and, and open both the Q&A and the chat panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for this series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming and data integration products. William is a leading global influencer with Data Warehouse in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads McKnight Consulting Group, which has twice played on the incorporated 5,000 list. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get his webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and welcome everybody. Welcome to this edition of Advanced Analytics. I am happy to be bringing you this edition from live from New York City, uh, away from my home base uh, today, but that doesn't matter. I have my trusty microphone and away we go. So today we're going to be talking about assessing new databases, translatical use cases. Yeah, we're going to focus on use cases today. So I'm going to talk about all these new real-time use cases that uh, we're trying to maybe force fit into older architectures and there may or may not be a better way for that. There may or may not be a way of the future uh, coming that incorporates both transactions and analytical. We will, we will drill down on that topic today. Now, you may have heard the terms HTAP for hybrid transactional analytical processing or HOAP hybrid online analytical processing, or maybe you've heard operalytical. I had to pick one uh, that uh, would pro probably bring in uh, the most people. So I chose translytical, but uh, it's all the same. All these four terms uh, trying to address this new emergence of uh, databases that can handle both. Uh, you may also, have heard, I'm sure you've heard of event-driven. Uh, that's that's, there's a lot of overlap between an event-driven architecture and a translatical uh, database. So we'll get into that a little bit here as we go along. So I thought today that I would highlight uh, our offerings to uh, vendors, uh, because we get a lot of vendors uh, in the audience for this, which is great. And I will just shorten this up by saying that we offer uh, some real competitive education to vendors in all data spaces, whether that's a ter complete teardown of the competition or educating you with workshops about your competition. All right, so here are the two sides of data processing today, OLTP versus OLAP. And so I just wanted to be sure we're all on the same page in regards to this because most of us have lived in one or the other world. And maybe, or maybe not, we regard the other world as being inferior or less interesting or what have you. But I want to be sure that we're both at least up to speed somewhat with the differences here. OLTP, online transactional processing. This process is business interactions as they occur. So it might be the airline reservation, the uh, checkout at the grocery store. It might be processing a claim in healthcare, something like that. OLTP supports limited query. Why is it limited? Because the OLTP is busy and typically um, doing all it can do to support those transactions. And there's a focus here on insert, update, delete, getting the transactions in, updating transactions as changes are made through other transactions, right? Insert, update, delete, and individual transactions. Low latency and high throughput is what is needed in OLTP. It also needs to have asset compliance. That stands for atomicity, 
consistency, isolation, and durability. So I've talked extensively about this before, but it has to do with making sure there's integrity uh, in the transactions. And then a, usually the OLTP has what looks like a normalized data model where there's a lot of tables and every table has only columns in it that support the primary key in addition, of course, to the primary key column or columns. So this tends to uh, involve a breakout into a lot of tinier tables uh, than OL OLAP with its dimensional modeling. Um, OLTP is, is where we have to start, where we have to start the business. Um, without, OL, without transaction processing, there is no business. Now, OLAP, online analytical processing, that is what's going to bring a lot of more value to the business. And that's where you can differentiate. You're not just processing transactions, but you're bringing analytics to bear on those transactions. And this is complex, can be more complex analysis. A lot of times, because of the limitations of OLTP databases, we offload processing from OLTP to OLAP. So all the things we'd like to do to the data, we're doing uh, downstream, of course, not real time, but we're doing in our OLAP databases that we push the data to. Typically, this data is modeled dimensionally where you have a fact table, so-called fact table in the virtual middle of the model surrounded by dimension tables that are often multiple levels uh, packed within a single table. It's a beautiful thing. And uh, many of us uh, on this call, I'm sure, have spent our careers doing that and doing OLAP. There is light data modification from source, but the point is data modification from source is certainly available. Uh, I think there could be more for data quality, but that's sometimes a tough proposition to be changing data, period. At the least, maybe we don't change data, but maybe we uh, bring some additional analytical columns to bear on our OLAP than, than what appears in OLTP. These are complex queries that run against OLAP, and frequently they are long running and nobody likes what, what they would deem to be long running queries, but let's face it, a lot of them are longer than we would like. And they tend to be longer than OLTP, which is more or less single record uh, retrievals. So OLAP can span terabytes to petabytes of data, those queries. And there tends to be a large data accumulation. Where are you accumulating history? Are you accumulating it in OLTP or in OLAP in a data warehouse or data lake? Uh, data warehouse and data lake, by the way, are OLAP constructs, unless we're talking about some sort of uh, very different operational hub type of thing. So uh, data warehouse is probably the quintessential OLAP database. And it's a term that in the past few years especially has become very uh, frequently used, uh, maybe to describe things that uh, some of us may not say is a real data warehouse, but whatever that term does apply over in the OLAP arena. So the data warehouse, yeah, what about that? Well, why doesn't it just work for these this new breed of transactions? Well, it's not dead. Uh, I'm not saying the data warehouse is dead, but I am saying it's dying. I am saying this notion of having to copy all the data around to a separate store is now really starting to, to die out as a need. I still think, I think we're gonna need a data lake to capture all that historical data. Data lake being kind of cheaper storage, kind of storage that you are doing really long running data science type queries on and so forth. Interestingly though, watch your terms out there. Watch your terms because one database vendor uses S3 as their primary store and applies its own block storage to that. And they call what they deliver a data warehouse. Another vendor does the exact same thing, applying their block storage to S3. They call theirs a data lake. It's the same thing. So anyway, be careful out there with terminology. I think I say that every, every presentation. Capability requirements. So what do we need? We need analytics on live data, recent data, and historical data, not just on historical data, not just, what, not, just not taking current context into play. Real-time analytics is what we need. Calculated from across data domains, many data domains. We need some pre-calculated data though. Pre-calculated data is a necessary evil in data architecture today because 
the data that we want to bring to bear on a real-time uh, operation, such as real, real-time real-time analytics, um, we don't have the time to calculate them all on the fly. So pre-calculation is necessary. Of course, pre-calculation is not the greatest thing in the world either, right? Because it's not going to take into account right up to the minute, right up to the second, I should say, data. So where you go pre-calculated versus where you let things be live and maybe impact performance, wow, that's an art form. That's why you have a data architect in place to make big decisions like this. And if you're putting in place some new systems, you might make a hundred of these decisions uh, along the way. So a lot of fun, uh, but uh, you know these decisions are critical to performance and critical to functionality. Live analytics is what we need. We need our live analytics to be usable operationally, not just calculate them live and store them away, but calculate them live and use them right away. And so we are, we're in this, we're in this world, we're moving to this world where we cannot predict everything that's going to happen. We can utilize more data than we can pre-calculate, okay? So we are considering, as we move along here, we're considering every situation out there in our business is unique. And I'll get I'll drill in on this more because this is a very important concept for us to understand as we think about our architectures, uh, as we can use more data, bring more data to bear on our transactions. We're going to need more data uh, stored and usable. A seamless platform is what we need. We need operational SLAs. We need to meet the operational SLAs. That's that's number one, isn't it? If we're not meeting operational SLAs, all the rest is unimportant. So I'm talking a lot about analytics here. It's a term that we in the industry throw around a lot. And I don't think we're on the same page with it. So let me define what, I'm, what I mean by it. Anyway, analytics is the process of utilizing data to enhance business processes. Okay. Analytics is deep and simple knowledge. They have depth. And we could talk all day about the depth is, you know, what, what is depth here? Uh, I won't do that. But... It's deeper than, okay, let me look up this customer's uh, address. It's more like, let me research this customer's uh, complete history and everything going on around him or her at this moment and determine what the next best course of action may be. That's deep. That's deep. That's not a shallow lookup. So there's what we call analytic projects projects that are really focused on this, they get bud, get their own budget. And then there's analytics that we add to projects. And sometimes we add them too late or we under scope them or we under scope their importance. So, uh, but they're, I mean, they're both the same in, in regards to needing these analytics to be brought to bear in real time on operations. So where, where do analytics come from? They come from batch and they come from real time. And this is that art form that I was talking about earlier. Uh, batch oriented analytics are ones that have broad context. The ones that drive reactions. There's action options, uh, like for example, a driverless car. When a driverless car sees a stop sign, it should stop at the stop sign. There's really no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And this, this applies to most people. Yeah, this should probably apply to all people. Um, and these rules are relatively uh, static and don't change. And these are just, they are rules that you can say every time do this. Now, real-time rules get more complicated. They're more dynamic. And this takes into account the immediate context. You can never tell, predict, what the immediate context is around a transaction. Not when you consider maybe, you know, the hundred variables that we could possibly get our hands on at the moment of that immediate, of that transaction, okay? This is activity that's not, that we cannot do in batch. This is unique activity. Now you may say, well, there's not a lot of uniqueness to what we do, you know? Somebody's in the store, they're buying a whatever, and we just sell it to them and, and that's it. That, that may be true today for you, but the way things are going, there's a lot of variables around that transaction that could be brought to bear to 
make the right next, next best action for that customer, for the company. So like if a car, if one of these uh, automatic cars, autonomous cars is running low on gas and the gas station, I say low, I mean, should, I should use a more descriptive term, an eighth of a tank of gas. The gas station is 20 minutes away. Home is 30 minutes away, but tomorrow is not as busy. Maybe I can get gas, maybe I can get gas in the morning. Maybe I'm running a little tired right now. So there's a lot of things that can be brought to bear on the decision of whether to pull in, get gas or not. Um, analytics, uh, every time, uh, the, the batch stuff is anytime, again, anytime A happens, you do B. But real time is when you bring into bear a lot of different variables. So the benefits of real time analytics, speed is number one. Speed uh, means that you're not considering things after the fact, you're considering them in real time, you're not hampering the transaction unduly so that it, uh, it is impaired, customer service is impaired, uh, the network is impaired, things like this. You don't want that. But it helps you seize opportunities. And then there's the customer experience benefit where businesses can anticipate problems and streamline operations. I wish my, uh, my website provider <laughs> would have anticipated the problems with my website this week so it didn't go down for a day. Um, but anyway, that didn't happen. So maybe they could benefit first from some real-time analytics. Uh, there's also operational excellence. Real-time anal analytics allows organizations to gain a clear view of the business and understand what needs to be done to address potential operational issues. And it's all about that deeper understanding. So when there is a need for deeper analytics to make a business decision, real-time analytics can help compare real-time and historical data to inform the decision. Now, I'm going to get to some solutions to these real-time analytics challenges, but do know that most of the real-time architectures are focused on, and rightfully so because that's kind of the problem area right now, real-time ingest, real-time ingest. Without the ingest of the data, we don't have a lot. These are some translytical use cases. So we're here to talk about these use cases. I'm here to raise your awareness that if you're working on one of these use cases, you need a real-time architecture. And that real-time architecture needs to bring to bear analytics on the operation. And I, I won't read them all. You see them here. Maybe you can find your way in there. Of course, there's plenty more. The keywords that I listen for to know if I'm in a translytical situation, which is becoming increasingly more and more. Real time, real time analytics, operational excellence. How can you have excellence in your operations without analytics? Just, just transacting? I don't think that's real excellence. Operational analytics, real time data warehouse. A little bit of an older term, but nonetheless, when I hear that, you might be, uh, you might be in this category. Real time analytics essentially means that data is provided for analysis almost immediately once it is collected. And it's a way of the future. A way of the future is not to have a second store where we have to copy everything. The way of the future is more or less virtual integration that happens fast enough and brings to bear all real time uh, data on the situation in real time. So in other words, all possible uh, options are considered for a transaction and the right course of action is chosen based upon all the variables in play. And by the way, 90% of your transactions, let's say you have, uh, I don't know, let's say you're considering 20 analytics for a given transaction. 90% of those transactions may only use one or two, but the higher value ones are going to get into more and more. And over the course of time, you're going to learn as a company, no matter what your transactions are, you're going to learn to use all 20. You're going to learn to blow past that 20 into many more. So let's talk about some examples. Okay, these are some examples from practice. And the first one is sort of, sort of general. It applies to many of them. And that's the next best offer or touch. I've kind of already alluded to it, right? This is the need to incorporate not only analytics through last night, but also today, all morning, the last hour and the last second, 
into whatever you're rendering on the screen about that customer, about that transaction. And maybe you're not even screen rendering it. Maybe more or less uh, for the future, it's going straight into the right operation, right next best business process. Need to incorporate not just the user's data, but all user's data. Because yes, I may not have purchased on one of these so-called promotions that you have, but there may be an explosion of purchases by people like me of that promotion in the past uh, 24 hours. That would be information that you want to bring to bear. Plus you're correlating my next best offer with people like me and maybe somebody just sort of moved into that category of being quote unquote like me. This is, this is very dynamic. And this is not stuff that you can do in batch and be effective with anymore. And eventually it's only AI that's gonna be able to operate at the needed scale. So this is uh, next best offer, next, next best uh, touch point is a theme that you'll see throughout these examples. So this is, this is a real example from the financial market. They had billions of API requests daily. They needed five to 10 millisecond average response time. So the data they wanted to include was real time and historical stock price, cryptocurrency, Forex, commodities, currencies, premium data, pretty much you name it. And front office traders needed the real time analysis. There's no, there's no, uh, let's take this in batch. Let's, uh, let's wait for the warehouse to operate overnight. Even a real time data warehouse, let's, you know, it's, it's, you're still waiting on something to be pushed and calculated and fed back. Real time analytics, a lot of it is data is left in place, but the architecture is able to reach out to all the places where that data is and bring the right information to bear on the transaction. Premium data in this example comes from a growing community of curated partners such as Wall Street Horizon, which has corporate events, fraud factors, audit analytics, value engine, which does forecasting, and stock twits, which is an investor social media platform and much more. So there's a lot of data to be brought to bear in the day to day of that company. Healthcare, as it moves to genomic medicine, the amount of data that needs to be considered to make the right health decision is going to jump enormously. We're into virtual business now, telehealth and AI doing the triage of us as we have health uh, conditions. AI diagnostics, robotics automating lab work. So what needs to be considered in real time for this healthcare company, for the healthcare industry, really. Well, recalls, do we really want our, our provider to be waiting 24 hours to, to know about a recall and act on it? How about outbreaks, COVID-like outbreaks? Um, yeah, I wanna know about that. The latest findings in research, in field work, and so on, and just simply the pandemic footprint. What is, what is that looking like now and how does that factor into whatever healthcare I might be providing to the individual? Human beings have roughly 20,500 genes and in DNA housed in each and every one of the trillions of cells that make you who you are. What causes what action? It's complicated. There's a lot going on there. And so batch analytics are still going to be very needed in healthcare as we get sort of general learnings, but you can see the depth to which those, even those batch analytics are going, as well as not to mention the real time part of the equation. Putting those two together, healthcare has a long way to go and a lot of opportunity. A retailer, a retailer. Better and personalized product recommendations, so similar to the right next best offer, right? Continuous and automatic retraining of the ML engine. Now, I highlight that because that is something that we need to understand as we get into machine learning for all the things that we do. And that is that those engines need to be continuously and automatically retrained. We need to get to that full 360 degree view over business operations, and to, and to improve customer satisfaction. And that 360 degree view is not something that's calculated in batch. It includes the now. It's very much up to, has to be very much up to the minute. Now this is a 
metaverse company and now they're incorporating VR chairs, vests, scent generators, and better directional sound systems, avatars as full virtual agents, and uh, some people have gotten surgical implants to uh, do things in the metaverse. Hmm. Anyway, the metaverse is all about simulation. And av these avatars are able to act within tightly defined parameters as our agents, our companions, and some may be, even be considered co-workers. It's all real-time, real-time actions, just, just kind of like a video game. All real-time actions based upon context, based upon what is going on at this moment and considering what we have learned about the entire concept. So in a metaverse, this could be a metaverse city that needs to be managed, could be uh, one of the metaverse attractions that needs to be managed, etc. So you can have a full parallel life in the metaverse, and this is where NFTs and crypto are going to take off. So Bitcoin may displace the US dollar at some point as the primary form of global finance, etc. The metaverse is going big. There he is. And yeah, it's all real time. Transportation is becoming real time, it's becoming driverless and autonomous. Floating or vertical warehouses delivering packages. That's how packages are going to start being delivered. Urban transportation from city centers. Airbus drone-like pop-up concepts uh, are going to be happening more and more. I understand here in New York City, I can grab a, uh, a helicopter uh, over to the airport. I might do it sometime just for the, for the fun of it. I don't think I want to work my schedule such that that is necessary though. That, that seems pretty packed. But what kind of real-time information do you want to bring on systems like that? Transportation systems. Well, traffic comes to mind as I look out over some real traffic here and weather comes to mind. The current weather and the patterns, it's constantly changing. This is real-time information that transportation companies need to be on top of and need to, need to be delivering <clears throat> analytics around. Now, this one is sort of a general one that has to do with any of a number of our clients or companies out there that you know of that are using cameras and audio recording. Cameras will be abundant. They are getting very much abundant. Of course, that's all real-time information that it's taking in. So what does it do with the real-time information? Is it, is it back to what I was saying earlier? Is it always going to do the same thing based upon what it's seeing? Or it, are there times when it's going to want to consider who it's looking at, what the context is, what the weather is, uh, who's around him or her, what's around, you know, uniquely at this moment in time. Persons, a person's profile will become more and more evident. So if we walk into a furniture show, showroom virtually, We'll do it virtually, and before you say anything, the store will know your name, employment status, car buying history, and credit rating. And maybe where you've been today, the clothes you're wearing, and how about your criminal history, your consumer history, and your marital past. It's only a matter of time before data brokers begin drawing from online dating profiles and social media posts as well. And how about, how about our DNA information, such as what? 23andMe, <clears throat> et cetera, have collected. So uh, we will eventually uh, allow all of this for the convenience that it offers. And so that's a lot of information to bring to bear on a lot of possibilities for what to do with what that camera is looking at. Eventually, someone might be able to point a phone at you or look through their special contact lenses and see a bubble over your head marking you as unemployed or recently divorced. We'll no longer be able to separate our work cells from our weekend cells. Instead, our histories will come bundled as a pop-up on stranger screens. We're already doing some of this. Some devices that we talk to will record and upload our conversations like Amazon Echo, and then there's the talking Hello Barbie doll that sends those things wirelessly to a third-party server, where they are analyzed by speech recognition software and shared with vendors. Read the fine print. Even our thoughts could become hackable. I'll stop there. My point is, it's a lot of information to be 
bringing to bear on the moment. And if you can't act in the moment with this information, it's, it's almost useless, especially when you're talking about cameras and audio recording because people are moving, right? They're not standing still waiting for the batch analysis to happen so that the next right best action is going to happen to them. What about in manufacturing? On the manufacturing floor, there are real-time dashboards showing everything that's going on. There's a variety of data sources. When they ingest data, they must recalculate the entire data set. This is, what, this is where they were before they moved to a translatable architecture. Cross-matching survey results at the team and individual level, and they were very concerned with their NPS score, as are many companies. Processes that formerly required 10 steps were streamlined down to just one when they fixed their architecture and moved to a true translatical architecture. So this company previously had to run their advanced analytics offline. And if you looked at the dashboard and wanted to drill through, the waiting times were mm, too painful. So that just wasn't going to happen. So it has to be done automatically, has to be done in real time. This company in the past, in order to provide those analytic insights, they were moving data into SPSS. Remember that? That was slow. But with a translatical approach, they can now slice and dice data in real time and in regards to NPS, instantly understand the validity of a data correlation. So every little thing goes into the NPS score and they need to know how and what things and take action in real time. Now, <clears throat> asset management. Into an asset vis visibility was necessary here. And they needed one place to discover all the assets in the environment. And this was constantly changing. And they needed instant context around risk, vulnerability, threat assessment, and threat detection. They can't wait for the data warehouse to come up with these things. And when the data warehouse comes up with these things, it's all general. It's all applies to everybody in every situation that we can think of or put our, put our data arms around. Instead of it being open-ended, here's all the data in the universe that we have access to, use it and do the right thing. And that's what we're moving to. This company had 100 billion events per day, devices, firewalls, IoT, et cetera, they originally were using a Postgres SQL database. And over time, this, the time-based data set got too large for Postgres to handle. At this point, the team migrated this data set from 400 plus Postgres SQL databases into a huge Elasticsearch cluster. Moving forward, right? Um, so security surveillance, this is gonna be similar to the camera example I had before. This company had a goal to view all sites in a single cloud-based package and offer analytics from video data. Here again, we see unstructured data, which makes the process of analytics all the more complicated. You may, you may think of some analytics that you want to have in a situation like this, but do you really want to calculate it in batch for everybody? Or do you want to calculate it on the fly for only those situations that could use the analytics. Well, that being the case, you want to move to more of a real-time analytics approach where the data is where the data is and you're able to bring it all together in one place. The biggest change here was scalability with their OLTP database. Trying to scale that for analytics too doesn't usually work. Finance. Now, embedded finance that's what this company does, is when the non-financial companies offer their customers access to credit through their technology platform. And this is happening more and more. So they started with an easy to prototype, ingest data, do basic reports, which required replica sets, which had to be done automatically. The there were performance constraints on rights to the Postgres SQL database. They had to do a bulk load of the data. The replicated data need to be re-ingested in the dashboard or only refreshed once every 24 hours, leading to a serious and unacceptable lag in data freshness. Now, for those of you that are, that are out there saying, well, you know, that's, that's good enough. Nobody's rattling my cage to do anything more frequent than 24 hours. So I'm gonna work in that mode. 
Well, <clears throat> think of the possibilities of what could be done in less than 24 hours. Think of the possibilities of what could be done with up to the minute data. Now, you, you may think of them and not be able to think of anything, and that's okay. That's gonna to apply to some situations, but as time goes on, that 24 hour period is just not, just not going to be acceptable to bring to bear insights. We're gonna to have to do it on a more frequent basis. Esports, this will be my last example, my last use case for you. They needed to offer real time and historical live streaming data to analyze trends and performance across all genres, games, events, and channels, kind of like a, a video game, right? They need to work with thousands of time series data points in complex multi-gigabyte aggregated queries. Analytic speed is a top priority and they need to understand spikes in viewership. Now you can transpose your company into one of these slides, I am sure, and come up with similar needs. Well, all these needs uh, of all these companies, including the one you're looking at here, uh, has to do with they have a translatical need. So let's address the translatical need. Data architecture needs for translatical workloads. You need fast streaming ingest, millions of events per second. LinkedIn has 80 million events per second. Now we're not all LinkedIn, I know that, I know that. But we're somewhere in there and we're all kind of moving in that direction. All mid-size and up companies are wanting to get a hold of or at least utilize all of their events. Low latency is what you need. You need high concurrency, perhaps thousands of concurrent users, you need unlimited storage, pipelines, not ETL, and you need transactional consistency. So that asset, the asset properties. You need parallel, high scale streaming data ingest and immediately immediate availability of that data. Well, there's different needs, different ways to skin this cat. And that's what we'll talk about here. Now, this is a data architecture that is not fit for translitical. You might look at it and go, wow, I'd like to have that architecture. We're a little messier than that. Uh, that's okay. Um, I'd like you to have that too. If this is, if you're not up to this level, right? Where you have nice low latency uh, sources that are stream processing or spark processing through to a data lake, which is also your staging to your data warehouse. You also have batch input from transactional databases into your data lake, which is feeding your data warehouse. The data warehouse and the data lake work together in a lake house environment, which starts uh, its queries at the data warehouse level, which reaches through to the data lake. The, the data warehouse also will do some calculations, some analytics, if you will, and uh, that those will be passed on to the data lake where all history data is kept. Now in this architecture, people tend to be on one side or the other, on, either on that pre-analytical, or I should say, you know, operational side of the line or on the right side, which is more your analytical side of the line. And, and yeah, you see there's a big old wall, big old Chinese wall uh, between these two uh, worlds in this architecture. Now, one database solutions trying to do analytics with operational databases or trying to gather multiple, to put together multiple databases to power up the applications with analytics is what we've been doing, what we've been trying. So question here to think about, is it more that analytics need operations or the operations need analytics? Which way which way does the data need to, to flow in this? It's really analytics that are trying to do operations today and failing. And also MySQL, PostgreSQL, those sorts of things. Uh, they are also uh, trying to do analytics and operations in many environments. And we're failing at that too. Now you might say, well, I'm not failing. You know, I'm, I'm succeeding. Well, what is the depth of the analytics that you're really doing? Uh, with that sort of an approach. I would say it's probably less depth than what it will be or what it could be even today. So that's something to think about. Not just, again, not just am I meeting user demands, um, you know, or are, are, are people pounding my door for more? That is not a good barometer for whether you're doing enough. 
and think about what what the possibilities are and make sure you're you're striving to that so yeah the wall between now some of us have been around long enough to remember when this was in vogue the operational data store okay so this is when a source system usually one fed a database that sat kind of between uh, that source and the data warehouse it's not a not just a staging area but it was a staging area upon which queries were run because those queries couldn't wait for integration at the data warehouse level or they really didn't need the integration they just needed to fix the problem of the transactional database not being able to do or just to um, take on the query. So we created a database in the middle, basically, an ODS, right? Um, usually these were, again, single source. This was our attempt at real time for access in the past. Okay, what about the data lake house? We're hearing a lot about the data lake house. A lot of vendors are adopting this terminology, uh, sometimes begrudgingly because only one company came up with it, but nonetheless, uh, the concept is applied at, with many vendor products now. Data lake houses are great, and I'm not saying no to a data lake house approach, of course, but I am saying that that's, on the face of it, is not enough to do translatical. They do not support transactions, and they do not enforce data quality very well, and their lack of consistency and isolation makes it almost impossible to mix pens and reads and batch and streaming jobs, okay? Most major data platforms have converged their messaging around this. So you're going to hear a lot about it. Um, and I'm just putting it out there to say, hey, it's great. And this can be a component of your translatical approach, but it doesn't solve the operational problem that you're still going to have. What about NoSQL? Well, some NoSQL vendors are veering into translatical territory. However, on the face of it, NoSQL for operational big data is a great thing, and uh, but it's for the op for operational big data, operations, not analytics. So what NoSQL gives you is more data model flexibility. You don't have to schema first the data. You can load it and right, right off, and faster time to insight from data acquisition. They relax the acid so you can get that data in. There's low upfront software and development costs, fault tolerant, redundancy, and linear scaling to web scale. So you're not worried about scaling with these NoSQL databases. And indeed, a lot of transactional databases are being replaced by NoSQL databases. That is great, but that is only part of the answer to the translatical problem because the analytical side of things uh, isn't here so much. And these are not set up for great uh, complex analytical queries as much as they are for getting the data in. So there's a lot of data that's fit for NoSQL, but not completely for translatable. Event-driven architectures. So I mentioned LinkedIn had its, what, 80 million transactions or events per second. Do they need to store all that? Or do they just need to process it? I think they just need to process it. A lot of my clients have way more events than really need to be stored. Now, they might store it, store some data on a selective basis. There might be a selective feed to a data lake. Uh, but this is sort of translatical because you can perform the analytics that you need in some of these architectures. And you're certainly getting the detailed data flowing through and you're processing on that, the question becomes, what is the depth of processing that you can do on events? And the more depth, the more you're into analytics, the more you would be into a translatical architecture needs. So uh, and I'll show you some examples from Azure and AWS here in a bit, uh, their, their answer to event-driven architectures. And you might look at that and say, well, that's what we need. A Kafka connector, real-time PubSub messaging platform, and edge computing to kind of spread the computing around, around and also get, get things closer to real time out on the edge. So I guess the point of this really is, uh, as you're thinking about this, make sure you're storing only that which you need to be storing. I know that, that sounds kind of different coming from me and coming from maybe 
a data driven person, but uh, I've, I've seen the light, you know, with uh, with some of these companies and all their events and and done some calculations around, you know, the cost to store it and even the ability to store it today. So I think things will change over time. All that data will be interesting all the time. Uh, we're not there yet. That's probably a decade out. But for now, uh, my clients are storing selective data to a data lake that maybe the data scientists can do some deeper research on, like summaries of data, like spot uh, levels of data, like maybe all the data for all the events for a given store so that I have all events for a store that I can look at as I develop improvements to my business, to my operations. So that's important. What about single product architectures? How about a single table with storage for transactions and analytics? Well, what does that look like? I thought there was one way to store data. No, there could be more. This is going to give you fast IUD and query, a simplified data architecture, and reduced data movement, and true translatable in one product, because it has a row store and a column store. Now, we're mostly familiar with the row store out there, and if you haven't done anything but create table, uh, it's probably a row store. Uh, now, some of these analytical databases, they default to column store, so you may not even know it, but some of them are column store. So what's the big deal here? in terms of how the data is stored. Why does it have to be stored two ways? Well, let's talk about the column store. Maybe if you're not aware, some light bulbs will go off here. Single store, I'm using them as an example here. They use two storage types internally, an in-memory row store and a disk-based column store. Here's a look at the column store. And I, I show the possibilities here. This is a customer table, all right? And you can group up uh, many or one column in consecutive storage. And that's what a column store basically is, is that all of a column's value is stored together. So first name, all the first names are stored together. Last name, all the last names are stored together. Maybe, maybe that's not a good example because you might want to store both of them together. But however you, however you do it, and by the way, you see all the possibilities here. There's, there's even more than this for these, this small set of columns. So it is important that you design this well Possibility one is basically a row store because all of the columns, all five columns of this table are stored together. So that's that's what a row store does. No benefit there. But possibility two is a full on column store where each column is stored individually, consecutively on disk. So all the first names, all the uh, actually customer name, customer city, customer say, all of them are stored separately. And they can be glued together or pieced together in a query if you need multiple columns, which frequently you do, based upon their position. Their position within the, in this case, we're gonna call them containers. All right, now in this architecture, readers don't need to wait on writers. Each version of the row is stored as a fixed size structure. Variable length fields are stored as pointers. This is all according to the table schema, along with booking bookkeeping information such as the timestamp and the commit status of the version. So who does this? Oracle kind of does this. They have a dual store approach, obviously a single store, which I'm using as an example here. Now, interestingly, Snowflake has announced combining transactional and analytical with Unistore. And I think that's significant that a company like Snowflake would make that announcement. Why are they doing that? Well, they, they see that they see where the future is. And so what I encounter a lot is customers trying to do analytics with operational databases. Uh, that doesn't work. Or try, tying together multiple databases to power applications with analytics, kind of, in a, kind of in a kludgy way. We also replaced a lot of the first generation operational databases, such as MySQL, Postgres, RDS, and also augment data warehouses, or even Hadoop, to power real-time analytics. Now. I promised Azure and AWS here. Okay, the Azure real-time environment is what you see here. Notice the bi-directional arrows coming from that top looking box between the Azure ML managed online endpoint and Azure machine learning into the data lake and into the Cosmos DB, which is an operational DB. Now, 
This is two databases. They are separate, but they're tied together because the machine learning is feeding both appropriately. So what you got in here, you got Microsoft Azure and Microsoft Intelligent Data Platform. You got Azure Kubernetes Service, which I have recently done a benchmark on, by the way, in case you're interested in that, let me know. Azure, Azure Cosmos DB, Synapse Link for Cosmos DB, Synapse Analytics, Synapse Pipelines, ADLS Gen 2, Azure ML, Power BI, and Microsoft Purview for data governance. Yeah, all these pieces are in this architecture, making it all event-driven, making it all real-time, and solving a lot of the problems of Translytical. It's a bit to put together, though, I must say. AWS's real-time environment is similar. Uh, similar things, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, called EKS, DynamoDB, Glue, Redshift, at, on S3, SageMaker, and for data governance, uh, usually there's a third-party marketplace solution or a partner solution, like Alation or Calibra. Notice again the bi-directional arrow, arrows from the machine learning box to the data lake and the data warehouse, as well as the transactional database. And this is how those two are powered with real-time information, which is necessary to bring to bear on the operations, which is supported by DynamoDB in this architecture. Of course, this is all in AWS. You can replace components ad nauseum, as you will, and most of you do, somewhere or the other. Now, you can have a single product, single product for uh, for the solution to Translytical. There is a difference between one vendor, one product, and one vendor with two products, obviously. These are single vendor solutions, single store, also single product. Oracle, which I alluded to before, Snowflake with its Unistore, we have yet to see. I think, uh, I think the ink is not dry on whether that's a single product or a two product solution. Cassandra, Azure, which I showed you, AWS, which I showed you, Google, which has a similar picture to Azure and AWS, frankly. A little bit more on Oracle, they have that dual store approach rather than a single store, like single store itself. Uh, you need the Oracle database license, diag diagnosis and tuning pack, the Oracle rack option exadata for the columnar compression and performance. And we talked about how important columnar was in all of this. Partitioning pack and active data guard options. Snowflake, again, has announced combining transactional and analytical with the Unistore, which again, I find, I find significant. Now, you can tweak traditional architectures maybe by putting a cache in place on the data lake, uh, something like uh, what you see here with Redis. And the operate, maybe changing the operational databases to NoSQL, you're getting closer. Data lakes can be, however, if you're counting on them for uh, your real-time analytics, they can be difficult to manage and govern due to their size and complexity. They can be difficult to extract data from regularly due to variety and volume of data that they contain. So uh, this is, this is a, an approach that some have done. And when it comes to multi-vendor architectures, the list is endless of the possibilities, but these are some that uh, people have tried to deploy or are deploying for their real-time needs today. Spark, Cassandra, Elastic, Druid, and MongoDB, MySQL, Redis, and DynamoDB. These are just combinations that uh, we see out there in the marketplace. But still, organizations are sometimes reluctant to attempt to analyze real-time data, fearing the analytical workload will hamper the performance of the operational work that has to be the priority, as I've mentioned. That, in a nutshell, is a fear that we have to get over and we have to architect around. Hopefully you've seen some possibilities here today. We did a benchmark. You know we do a lot of benchmarks. We did a benchmark, and this is of a single database competing in both the analytical and the operational benchmarks, TPCH, TPCBS, and TPCC. And we found that this database, which supposedly does both, was actually better than both of the pure play data warehouses that we analyzed. So we did three different analysis. Two of them were different operational and analytical databases. 
glued together as in you know something we see in the field quite a bit and then one was a one database solution one of these uh, 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 single store databases so we've also found that uh, in TPCH it attained a geometric mean better than both of the pure play data warehouses in the TPCDS the analytic one of the analytic databases was superior okay but was it you know superior enough for the difference in performance that you're going to get the difference in manageability that you're going to get i don't know that's what you need to decide that's why all of these decisions that you have to make that you're going to be making in the next well for the rest of your career and my career you know they're all going to be sitting right there on the on the on the peak of the of the uh of the TP, right? Where it can go one way or the other. And that's where our decisions are going to need to come into place. So we need to keep our game up so that we can make these decisions right. Um, there are wrong decisions. I mean, there are decisions that are going to uh, greatly limit your possibilities. And we don't want to do that. And we also looked at uh, the costs here and we found that the single database costs were less. So given the vast superiority in transactional processing and the high competitiveness in analytical processing, the efficiencies of one database across the spectrum of enterprise needs should be considered. In summary, when it comes to translatical databases, you got options. First of all, recognize that you're in a situation where it is translatical. Applications are moving translatical. So lines blur between operational analytics, that hard line, that hard Chinese wall that I showed before, may or may not be relevant anymore. Analytics are deeper than simple knowledge. They have depth. That's what you need, depth. The need for real-time analytics drives the need for a translatical architecture. There are examples in every industry. We went through, I think, nine examples here today. Traditional architectures do not meet these re the requirements. There are multiple vendor, multiple products, same vendor and single products options here. And uh, some of where you go with this uh, appropriately may come from where you are today. Single product solutions combine row store and column store. And the, we showed you the importance of the column store to analytical queries. And my comment about don't forget the one database solutions out there. And that leads me to the end of the formal part. I welcome your Q&A as I turn it back over to Shannon while you look at the upcoming topics in advanced analytics. William, thank you so much for another great presentation. If, uh, just a reminder to everybody, and answer the most commonly asked questions, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and the recording. So diving in here, William, can you comment on tools like Stream Analytics at the Edge or Real-Time Series Engine like Azure Data Explorer? Um, comment on them? Yeah, I mean, um, um, we, we see a very strong move towards streaming in all forms of you know, data integration. Uh, streaming is, is the ultimate in terms of getting the data into the architecture ASAP. And so you know, we're, we're definitely looking at streaming in every place that uh, requires data integration today, just to be sure that it meets the needs of today and tomorrow. So, these streaming solutions that were mentioned are are great and valid. Uh, I am, you know, what I just said about how, how where streaming is going. Uh, I am floored sometimes at the at the popularity of streaming and and where it's going. So much, you know, harder and faster than probably any of us are 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 considering uh, out there. Um, I, I did go to the Confluent uh, conference a couple of weeks ago and talked to a number of vendors. There's so many new entrants in that space. And uh, it's a great way to get information uh, into the architecture. And uh, the question mentioned edge. We are all about edge computing. And uh, there's a great debates going on, I'll put it that way, in regards to what can be done at the edge. And of course, what can be done has to consider what data can be kept there, what processing can be done there. And uh, the good news is that, the po I think it's good news, <laughs> that the possibilities are increasing. I think I talked about this a little bit last time that we can now do AI at the edge. We can now consider a lot of analytics at the edge. Uh, we may or may not be able to calculate all the data and all the analytics and have all the data at our fingertips out at the edge, 
Uh, but that's where, you know, you still got batch analytics. As long as they're getting fed to the edge, you got analytics going at the edge. So there's a lot of riches that can be done there, a lot of possibilities. Perfect. And that brings us right to the top of the hour again. William, thank you so much again for another great presentation. And thanks to all of our attendees. And just to again, a reminder, I'll send the follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks, everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, William. Thank you. Bye-bye.